In A Good Death, The Human Dilemma and What Death Can Teach Us About Living, Dr. Amy White will summarize the condition of humanity that raises the questions of the purpose and goals of human life. Dr. White will suggest that working towards a good death may be the key to cracking the human dilemma and living a meaningful life. Dr. Amy White is an associate philosophy professor at Ohio University, Zanesville. She is author of Virtually Obscene, The Case for an Uncensored Internet, and a wide assortment of articles. Dr. White's current research focuses on medical ethics, neuroenhancement, and the philosophy of death. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Amy White. All right. Um, no, it wants to go back. So, <laughs> this uh, talk is normally um, done during a class period, so I'm going to have to speed it up just a little bit here. So, hopefully, we'll get to anything, everything. So, the meaning of life is this question that most people associate with philosophers, but. Um, the truth, very few of us work on it, and it's, it's a shame, and a lot of the stuff that we have um, comes more from authors than philosophers, Camus, Kafka, etc. Um, but as a philosopher, when you look at this question, you have to analyze it a little bit more deeply. When people say, what is the meaning of life, they could actually be you know, discussing several different questions. What is the meaning of life in general? What is the meaning of human life? What is the meaning of my life? or what constitutes a meaningful life. Each of these questions is distinct. So it's pretty nebulous when someone says just what is the meaning of life. So I think most people are most interested in what is the meaning of human life. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to discuss. Um, although it could be motivated by an internal, you know, what is the meaning of my specific life, right? Um, so, and of course the answer is 42, <laughs> but um, for those who know Schopenhauer, he was a rather cheery character, <laughs> and um, he said if the immediate and direct purpose of life is not suffering, then our existence is most ill-adapted to its purpose. So, for quite some time with the existentialist movement and pessimism, you had many people express doubts that life had meaning. Of course, a pessimistic existence or suffering is not necessarily the same thing as meaninglessness, right? There could be extraordinary meaning in the suffering, etc. Um, now, it's, it's quite easy for people that hold some sort of religious ten tenet to assign meaning. But what do we do, right? What do we do when we're guided by human reason and things like this? And I think that a lot of these philosophers, not guided by any type of religious background, you know, saw humans in a very peculiar place. And it's what I'm going to call the human dilemma. What I've tried to do is break down what I think is most intriguing and in some ways the things about our existence that seem to make it... Um, important to seek meaning. So I've broken it down to eight general parts, kind of looking at you know, the different authors and philosophers and the concerns that they've expressed. And then it leads to a very interesting conclusion. I also have a handout where there are three pieces of, well, two poems and one piece of literature that I think help um, express some of these uh, parts a little more eloquently than I can. So, um, as again, I said, there's eight parts and conclusions. Boy, it's gets in your hair. And I'm just going to go through them one by one. All right. Um, the first part is that we all die. You know, we are very temporary creatures. Um, all of us. And, you know, when you're young, you don't particularly think about this. Um, when you talk to much older people, this looms kind of large in their existence. Um, my grandparents started giving away things continuously, thinking about their death. Well, you'll remember me by this and this and this. And of course, we don't want to think about it, we don't want to hear about it, and this society has designed it so it is really removed from us. 
So it gives us not a lot of opportunity to engage death. And so it becomes this kind of mysterious, oh no, that will happen to us all, right? So that is one thing. We are just incredibly temporary creatures that will die. Um, now, that one doesn't honestly bother me as much as how we tend to die. It seems like nobody ever dies at the right time. <laughs> right? I mean, you either die much too young. It's like, oh, they could have done so much more. Right? So young, so much left to experience. Or we face this, you know, horrible process of aging where things start to break down. We become decrepit. Um, visit... Uh, Oh gosh, uh, my mother lives in an age-restricted apartment complex, and the topic is usually what's wrong today. You know what? <laughs> no, what hurts? Yeah. You know, I mean things as oh, and they're the very specific. You know things as if I didn't have my morning uh, bathroom trip. You know, it's very like you. They get well. Many of them get to this point where all that the focus is, is what is breaking down right now. And that's really unfortunate. Um, but yet, you know, I mean, let's think about something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I mean, if your basic functions are not working, you can't really think about you know, things that are much higher in that hierarchy. So, um, and again. <laughs> but it seems like one of these two things generally happen. I mean, maybe occasionally you get someone who dies just right. But <laughs> that, that doesn't seem to generally be the case. Um, I, I always hear one of these two comments. Well, well, it was, a, it was a blessing. That's what I hear a lot. Or, but they were so young. They still could have lived more. All right, so this is perhaps troublesome. Um, oh, and, and the one that, that really bugs me, and I don't know about you guys, but um, decrepit body is one thing, but when your mind goes, I know maybe it's just that I use it for my profession, that um, I had a neighbor uh, where I went to grad school, and she was the first woman, well, she was, well, she was 90 years old, but she was the, one of the first women at the college to um, receive her PhD. And she had been just, you know, so sharp at one point. And then she had a stroke when I lived by her. And um, she said to me once, she said, Amy, I, I can't find me. You know, she couldn't get her faculties working again. And um, it was one of the worst things I'd ever seen, the breakdown of the mind and the body. Um, and so that's troublesome. But I, I think this is even more so, is that... Everyone we love is going to die also, and probably not at the right time, <laughs> right? Um, the same neighbor that I talked about, her name was Mrs. Hill. Uh, when I first moved into my house beside her for graduate school, I had met her and she said that her husband had died 20 years ago. And, but I would wash dishes and things like this and I would see this old man go by the window. and. I'm not a person that believes in ghosts. So this was kind of, wait, your husband had died 20 years ago, and I kept seeing this. So I'm starting to get a little bit freaked out. So one day I, I go out to the deck, and this old man face to face, he's like, hey, I'm Mr. Wright. I'm over here. Very glad that ghosts you know, weren't actually visiting me in some way. <laughs> but um, she had a boyfriend. <laughs> Yeah, and his name was Mr. Wright. How cute is that? <laughs> <laughs> so they were adorable together. This was before her stroke. Um, but he died. And uh, she told me, um, and he had an illness, and it, it was horrible. But she told me, and, and this really broke my heart, that every morning that they worked together, you know, she would go and get the newspaper and have her breakfast out and then she would call him and they would discuss the newspaper together and this is back when we had landlines and um 
I guess what happened is that every day she would still put her breakfast out, get the newspaper, and her hand would start to reach for the phone. Then she would remember. And then she said to me after this, she said, look, everyone's dead. She was like 94 at this time. You know, ev everyone's dead. Every, all my friends, every, you know, it, it was, um, yeah. Everyone that we end up giving our heart to are, are us, them, will be gone. And that this coincides a little bit with the Blake poem, too. The worm, you know, from, from the moment that we're this fresh rose, we start dying. Right? All right. Um, and I think this bugs us even more than some other things, is that human life is, is incredibly transient. Everything we do, our personality, works, accomplishments, our memory, won't amount to anything in the end. Even those of us who, you know, are greats, <laughs> My students don't even know who Copernicus is these days. How sad is that, right? <laughs> like, do you realize you might still think that you're the center of the universe if not for this man? Um, they don't know, though. You know, Galileo is fading, too. They still know Einstein, but I mean, think that was a relatively short period of time. Um, you can name off some very great leaders, and they have no idea who you're talking about. They can tell you who all the Kardashians are. But, <laughs> you know, of course, in 10 years, nobody will know that either. So, uh, mm. that was annoying. So, everything we do um, is going to be swallowed up in the enormity of eternity. I was really proud of that phraseology. <laughs> but um, it's true, and um, I have a poem, Shelley's poem on there, I think illustrates that quite well. And if you've ever seen Breaking Bad, there's a... Yes, where he reads it. It is very powerful. The, the poem itself is very powerful. I mean, you have this leader who, you know, once probably had commanded vast armies and who is reduced to nothing but a trunk in the sand. So, I mean, everything we do is, is many ways going to amount to naught. Now, we are one of seven billion on this planet, or over seven billion. And, you know, we all think we do these kind of important things, but when we take a larger perspective, not so much. I know, stay with me. We're only four. It gets better. <laughs> okay, but it gets a little worse first. Um, human life is also essentially lonely. I mean, we might not feel alone, but we're alone in the sense that no one can get into our heads. It's almost solipsism. Um, no one can ever share our experiences. Even people who have experienced similar things to us can't tell how we feel because how we feel is accumulation of the current experience and everything we've had before that has shaped and molded our feelings and probably some of our genetics too. So no one can ever go through what you're going through. No one can ever experience your mind. And you can never experience anyone else's. You have no idea what people are thinking or feeling. You can make some guesses, but you could be wrong. So we are essentially alone in our heads. All right, so because of the fact that we are alone in our heads, we are in kind of a pickle when it comes to trusting people. Right? Um, love, trust, extremely hard to do, especially if we've been deceived many a time, right? Um, lovers, spouses cheat, friends deceive. We can never actually be sure that a person is truly who they say they are or what they're projecting to us. Never. And I'm sure we've all experienced this. We've all found people who were quite different than we thought them to be. Yeah. So, you know, these things are very difficult to navigate as humans. And also, um, the fact that we're even here, 
is a bit odd. I mean, it's radically contingent. Had your father, you know, not given your mother a couple more drinks? Who knows, right? <laughs> um, we're here only because our parents became amorous at a very certain time and because one spermazoa won a crazy race. And when you realize how many sperm are in an ejaculate, it's pretty amazing that we are here. Um, I mean, the chances are just crazy <coughs> that we're here. We easily could not have been, right? All sorts of little things influence whether you <coughs> could have been here or not. Even the things your mother ate earlier in the day. It would change the I, I know, well, we just won't go there. No one likes to think of their mother's vaginal acidity. But um, I know I don't, and now I am. Oh, jeez. But um, it, it's true. Just very little things could have changed our existence or non existence. Okay, and finally, you know, and especially as humanists. I think we have really high regard for human reasoning. I, I know I have high regard for human reason. I wouldn't be a philosopher if I didn't. But it turns out that we are skeptical. And we are subject to these arguments that we can't seem to work ourselves out of. I mean, at the end of it, you could be in the matrix. Who knows? You can't reasonably argue your way out of it. This could be a dream within a dream. You know, you could be a brain in a vat stimulated by some evil scientists currently and not actually here, although I don't know why they would do this to you. Um, so, I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities, and you can't coherently argue that. Then when you start to think about the truth, you know, what the hell is the truth? You know, philosophers like to talk about the truth with a capital T, but, see, the problem is, is that Truth will always be the truth filtered through human capacities. So trying to arrive at an overall truth is impossible. Immanuel Kant, I'm sure many of you have heard of Immanuel Kant, um, he pointed this out, you know. Truth will always be somewhat subjective because it's filtered through the person seeing it. Just our limited capacities as humans. The human mind might only open us up to a very small area of what could be the truth, much like our eyes only open us up to a certain spectrum. Now, we've developed many ways through science, et cetera, of evolving our perception, but we still have a limited processing apparatus in the human mind, although we're working on that a bit, too. So, oh, we have a problem. <laughs> So where does this leave us? Well, this is the conclusion, is that we're pretty much adrift in a world where reason fundamentally doesn't do a lot for us. Um, we have no point of departure because of our radical contingency, no goal, and in ma many ways, absolutely no idea where we are or what our course is. So this, I think, fundamentally, has been why authors have quested for meaning. You know, given all of these things about humanity, the human dilemma, the human condition, etc., what you want to call it, the fact that we're here leads us to look for meaning, to seek for some meaning to all of this strangeness. Okay. One of my favorite authors that did this Yes, yeah. a lot of you know. It's really hard to find a picture of him without a cigarette, though, so. <laughs> um, Camus. Um, Albert Camus has this essay called The Myth of Sisyphus, and it is easily one of my favorites. And he explains that we are absurd creatures, you know, reaching for some meaning to our existence, but you know, it, it turns out that we're, we're almost two creatures, right? We are a creature doing things, and then at the same time, we're the one looking at what we're doing and examining it, right? And this is a clash of perspective, a clash that I don't think that my cat has, right? 
you know, why am I laying out here in the sun? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that, you know, she has this, I could be wrong, she's pretty bright. I suspect if anyone has it, Zappa has it, but, you know, or, or I don't think that my dog, when, when she's happy, analyzes why she's happy in the moment, or anything like that, but we do. So this also gives us this capacity, you know, why am I even living? Camus thought that one of the most important philosophical questions was, why don't we even commit suicide? Why don't we just, you know, make an end and not keep going? Um, of course, you know, some people commit what Camus called philosophical suicide, where they basically just stop thinking about it. Ignorance is bliss, right? But he said there was another way that we could approach it. And he gives the example of Sisyphus from mythology. You know, Sisyphus was a man who angered the gods. And in return, they made him roll a rock continuously up a cliff just to have it roll back down over and over and over and over and over. And then Camus becomes depressing to most of my students and says, look, we are all Sisyphus. It's what we do. We all have our own rocks. We roll them up, they come back down, and there's a new one at our feet. And the finale is never quite as great as we think it's going to be. Right? I mean, I remember some of my own rocks, you know, getting a PhD. Um, and there was this weird thing called a job, which if you're a philosopher is not easy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then there's this tenure rock. And there's this full professor rock. The rocks, and those are just the academic rocks. Then there's all of our personal rocks too, right? Up they go, and then there's a new one in our place. Mechanical beings, but mechanical beings that have to reflect on the fact that we're being mechanical beings. Right? Which is really hard if it involves paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to explain to my secretary that in the light of everything, that this isn't worth anything. And thus, I shouldn't have to do it, but she doesn't seem to buy it. <laughs> yeah, alas. Nor does she have a sense of humor about it. <laughs> I think I should probably stop. Um, but, yeah. Well, whereas human life is an immortal, promptings for internet are. That's right. <laughs> Again, one of our rocks to get this to stop. Um, <laughs> But the funny thing is, is that the end of the myth of Sisyphus, um, Camus says that he can only imagine Sisyphus happy in some moments. That he has a possibility, even with all this rock rolling, to be happy. Because although human existence and circumstance is one way, what... What the gods can't control is how Sisyphus actually thinks about his situation. Right? So Camus imagines Sisyphus actually choosing a life of rock rolling. Like, damn you gods. Hope I could say that on the YouTube. Um, do you know the whole thing about swearing? I mean, curse words. Right? The, the idea that you could actually put a curse on someone with your words. How silly is that? <laughs> and we still believe, I mean, we still, no, no, forget that. Um, I, I warn my students right off, I will swear like a sailor some days, but I'll try not to for this. Um, so we're rolling these rocks up the hill, but we can choose this existence. So what he has done, he's forged personal meaning on an otherwise meaningless situation. And has found joy in the journey. So, I take that as a starting point for me. Now, fundamentally, we might not be able to find any universal meaning. People have been trying. I don't think they've succeeded in any way, shape, or form. The human condition is hard to overcome, but can we forge meaning? I mean, really, think about it. Some people have forged personalities on pet rocks. It can't be that hard, <laughs> right? So forging meaning on our existence. And I think it has a lot to do with perspective. Right? Um, Sisyphus' perspective, 
Not that I am being punished and this is horrible, but hey, you can't control how I'm thinking about this. You can't control the fact that I choose this and like this. And um, one of the things that, well, one of the criticisms I have of our culture is that our distance from death has perhaps not allowed us to fully explore meaning in ways that we should. Um, I have a picture there of, um, in, in Bali, the Balinese, when someone dies, they have a three-day celebration. But the first day, the body is brought out and people socialize with it, basically. It's washed, it's displayed, people drink around it like the person is still there. Then they celebrate, and then the last day, they have an elaborate funeral float, and the body is taken and burned right in front of everybody. When you really, really get your immortality out of your head and realize that you, know, you will be no more, you can start asking yourself these type of questions. And I make my students actually write their own obituaries. They hate it, but. Um, but the idea is, what do you still need to be in there before you die? And those are the things that are most meaningful to them. Really, what do you need to live a good death? You know, we're so sheltered from it. We don't see the bodies. You know, what we do is horrible. I mean, we, we take bodies, we pump them full of toxic, noxious chemicals, put them in $5,000 plus silk-lined caskets to implode, all the while keeping the distance and letting other people do it. Maybe if, if we saw bodies, maybe if we you know, saw the demise without it being so hush-hush, we would have more of an opportunity to say, you know, what do I want on my funeral float? The funeral float is decorated, sometimes during life, with those accomplishments that the person's done. You know, and on it, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, at least in my case, I, I don't want my salary written. I hope that would be embarrassing, but, you know, I, I don't want my salary written or these types of things. I want the adventures I've had, the people I've loved. You know, those things are the things that we really find meaning in. So at least we know where to forge. And thinking about death, I think, gives us the opportunity to think about that. You know, what do we need before we die? And um, there's this brilliant little book, um, Tuesdays with Maury. Have you guys read it? Yeah. I, if you've not, I highly recommend it. It's a quick read. You won't be able to put it down in a night. And it is filled with, with really beautiful things. But um, there's a Buddhist representation um, of kind of the life cycle. And the bird uh, usually figures highly as an image of death, in, in a lot of imagery, as a death bringer. Um, but in, in this little book, there's a conversation where he talks about... Um, a Buddhist idea that, you know, living a good life is, is learning how to die well. That at any time, there's this little bird of death that could land on your shoulder, and you, you ask yourself, would I be okay? Not that I want to die, you know, I mean, I, a lot of, well, most of us don't want to die, but would I be okay with it? And if you can say yes, you've lived a good life. Would I be okay if the bird landed on my shoulder at this moment? So yeah, so learning how to die well could be learning how to live well. Being settled with meaning at that moment of death might give us a path to meaning in life. At least these are my thoughts in the area. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, 
I'm doing some work right now. Um, I still have to go and access some of the database with um, a group of researchers in Cincinnati who've accumulated a giant database of suicide notes. And um, yeah, they've done a bioinformatics analysis to, and they can tell the difference between authentic and inauthentic suicide notes by the wording, the phraseology, and content markers. So I'm going to work with them on you know, common areas they see and then link them into a philosophical analysis. And um, some of them that I've seen are already a bit disappointing. Like, um, a lot of authentic suicide notes still have this one upmanship that humans unfortunately seem to have, like, look what you've made me do. <laughs> yeah. But, I, I know, that was so disappointing. But on the other hand, love factors in to so many of them. Mm -hmm. And this idea that they're telling people, please don't think you had anything to do with this. You know, that there is some love that pervades even in the middle of hopelessness. Um, I, don't know. I think though that looking at death, looking at the reasons why people die, and examining what we need at our death can be highly illuminating, although nobody ever seems to want to talk there are death cafes, though. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this, but a friend of mine leads some of them, and um, people go and they just talk about death now. Because it turns out in this culture, we, we have this real taboo about it, but people are yearning to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, I went to one of these cafes not too long ago, and um, I think they can be a really interesting experience. And um, perhaps, you know, um, help clarify, you know, our perspective. So, anyway, that's, um, that's what I have to say, so <laughs> questions. <laughs>